Okay, this is our first recording. This is for class on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off in class, and that is with Garfield being assassinated by a disgruntled office seeker. And as we talked about, Garfield was shot by Charles Goudier, July 2nd, 1881. He eventually dies on September 19th, replaced by Chester Arthur, his vice president. And the main issue here is the fact that uh, his death and the anger by the American public over his death led finally to some reform of the corrupt system that was involved in giving away government jobs to friends and supporters, uh, ultimately being created by the Pendleton Act that was passed in 1882. The Pendleton Act gave a requirement for anyone who was getting a federal job, and that requirement was that they must have some uh, ability to do the job, and that was found, or th the way that that was proven was by creating the civil service exam. This is a test that is still given today to anyone who is applying for a federal position, and the reason that that was actually created was the death of Garfield. So it took the actual death of a president to finally shake up the American people enough to get some sort of a change made in the corruption in the system. However, the vast majority of the corruption, as we've already talked about, continued. This leads us to the election of 1884, which is one of the major elections of the Gilded Age political period, and one that I definitely want you to focus on. It's a major election for many reasons, but one is the fact that for one of the only two times between 1860 and 1914, the Democrat is actually elected president. Uh, the Re Republicans continue to run on the bloody shirt issue, and the North, as you can see in the map, voted uh, quite a bit for the Republican James Blaine. However, uh, Cleveland will actually win the election. Now, what's interesting is this election seemed to really turn on uh, some political shenanigans that were pulled by both parties. Uh, in an, uh, with the knowledge that this election would probably be very, very close, uh, the uh, Democrats pulled out information or did opposition research on Blaine and found out that he had probably taken bribes dealing with railroad development in Arkansas. Uh, Blaine's campaign then began to dig around for information on Cleveland, and what they found was that Cleveland had actually fathered a child out of wedlock. Now, this was something that would be even less acceptable then than it is today. Um, specifically, the Republicans were hoping that this, as uh, one textbook once called it, personal slip, uh, would be something that would keep strong Catholic voters or very conservative Catholic voters from bringing themselves to vote for Cleveland but instead voting for the Republican Party which Republicans or excuse me which Catholics tended not to do and since Catholics were becoming more numerous in many of the urban areas in the north thanks to industrialization this would be a key way that the Republicans would be able to hold on to votes in the north in the very close cities and uh, urban areas in many key electoral states. So the de the Republicans took advantage of this situation and actually put out the, the cartoon campaign that you see on the bottom right. Uh, the famous phrase that goes along with this cartoon is, the baby is supposedly saying, Ma, Ma, where's my pa? Off to the White House. Ha, ha, ha. And so this was a something that just before the election looked like it would actually knock Cleveland out as it became public knowledge at that point. And so there was a sense that maybe some very conservative Catholic voters would break away, and many of them were either going to vote for the Republican candidate or not vote at all because they were so angry with Cleveland. But that was the situation just before uh, the election itself took place when a surrogate of Blaine gave a campaign speech in the state of New York, which had a massive number of Catholic voters. And in this speech... He claimed that the Democrats were the party of rum, Romanism, and rebellion. Now, calling them the, the party of rum was pointing out that uh, 
the Democratic Party was much more open to the idea of alcohol continuing to be available and not being regulated as many of the evangelical Republicans had wished that it would be. And of course, we know that will eventually happen with prohibition. So that's really not something that was a big surprise. Calling the Democrats the party of rebellion, well, that was the bloody shirt, and that had been done for a long, long time. But what this uh, campaign speaker, who was speaking on behalf of Blaine, said that caused all the great controversy was calling them the party of Romanism. Now, this was picking on the religion that many people in the Democratic Party had, which, of course, was Catholicism, and this made the conservative Catholics angry enough that they put aside their anger over Cleveland's personal behavior and instead voted for him. And as you can see there, Cleveland beats Blaine 219 to 182. And for one of the only two times between 1860 and 1914, we have a Democratic um, party member elected to the presidency. That leads us to the election of 1888, which is pretty important because in this case, the sitting president was voted out of office and again we talked a little bit about this before the tariff issue and you can see the cartoon there on the left uh, taking a pretty big hit on Cleveland as well as um, some of the corruption that was connected with his administration but the tariff issue uh, caused some of the northern voters who had voted for him uh, before to break away and instead go back to the Republican Party and so Harrison wins in 1888. This leads us to the election of 1892, and this, of course, is when something that has never happened since will occur, and that is Grover Cleveland won, lost, and then was re-elected in the following election as he ran against Harrison again. And in this case, Cleveland returns um, and wins in the Electoral College 277 to 145. Now, Cleveland will have a big problem because of the Panic of 1893 that will be another one of the panics like we talked about in 1819 where the economy goes down the tubes very quickly as people had overextended themselves when it came to um, investment and in speculation and the economy will contract very quickly and with Cleveland being in office the Democrat will be blamed but that leads us to 1896, which is a very important election in the history of the United States. This is the election where the farm discontent eventually became large enough that the Granges and the Alliances came together along with angry people in some of the cities and became what, be, what was known as the Populist Party vote. Now, in 1896, this vote really centered around the economy and the sense that many of those who had suffered through the Panic of 1893 had that the reason that they were stuck in the situation they were in was the hard money or gold standard dedication of the Republican Party and that they were the problem. Um, the desire that the populist and, of course, Democrats too had to expand the money supply led both parties, although the populist ran as a third party, um, the Democrats had their convention first in 1896, and as they went to the convention hall, um, there, was, there were a couple of candidates who were expected to be the nominees, but neither one won. Instead, William Jennings Bryan, a, a great orator who spoke with religious fervor, spoke before the Democratic convention, and gave a very famous speech called the Cross of Gold speech. And you can see the image there on the left, which was created concerning the speech. Now, in this speech, using uh, very religious terminology, Brian pointed out that what the Republican Party and the very wealthy were attempting to do to the common man was crucify them on a cross of gold, meaning they would stick with the gold standard and not expand to either silver or to greenbacks. And and uh, try and place a crown of golden thorns upon their heads. And he stood there um, uh, almost acting as though he was on the cross like Jesus. And after he made this pronouncement, the whole uh, convention hall erupted in chants of Brian, Brian, Brian. They carried him out on their shoulders, and he will become the nominee of the Democratic Party. The Populist Party, which had actually done some pretty significant stuff back in uh, 1893, and you'll notice 
that Weaver, the candidate for the um, populist, actually won, or the won the state of uh, Kansas as well as Colorado, Idaho, Nevada, and some votes in both Oregon and in North Dakota, and that was showing that the populist party, which is the candidate that or the party Weaver stood for, was making some uh, decent strides, and in fact their power had grown and they had in a sense taken over the Midwest but their view was that Brian's ideas were for them as well and so in a sort of a um, an anticlimactic uh, convention of their own they also nominated Brian so we had the weird scenario of two political parties nominating the same candidate William Jennings Bryan um, in 1896 now he's going to run against probably the prototypical Republican candidate, and this is William McKinley. McKinley, and by the way, they're still running on the the uh, bloody shirt, although it's beginning to fade dramatically. But McKinley represents big business, and he even looks, if you take a look at the picture, he's much he's clean shaven. He looks more like a business CEO, and he ran on a campaign of. Uh, continue uh, making America grow again and that big business was good and so this was really an election between big business and the common man and what happened here was very interesting because as you'll look at the map you'll notice that um, Brian won for the most part the middle of the country and the south again being a Democrat he took the solid south but uh, McKinley took the North and the Northeast and Oregon and California, although those votes are relatively small electorally at that point. But what really happened this election that was uh, important and definitely worth noting is that the city defeated the country in this election. This is the very first election where urban voters tended to vote one way, rural voters tended to vote the other, and the urban vote won because it was more numerous. And in fact, since 1896, that has been the general tendency of the United States, is that we have become an urban nation politically. And that's a huge change, change from what you remember the nation starting out as, a group of farmers. But this particular election was the one where uh, the city defeated the country and McKinley becomes president and Bryan is uh, defeated. So this leads us to William McKinley, who you could call the prototypical Republican, perhaps. He will serve from 1897 until he's assassinated in 1902. Uh, he will defeat Bryan both in 1896 and then defeat him again in 1900. Um, and this continues the dominancy of the Republicans in the presidency uh, from 1860 to actually 1932 when Franklin Roosevelt takes over only two Democrats are elected Cleveland and Wilson versus 11 Republicans all right so now we're actually going to move on to our next PowerPoint believe it or not and we're gonna take a look at some foreign policy uh, we got about a minute and a half left on this segment and then we'll pick up more in the next 15 minute segment but we're about to look at the fact that while all this is taking place the United States beginning in 1890 does something that it had never done before and that is look beyond its own borders in a very significant way and jump into the middle of what you're very familiar with from your studies last year and that is the global imperialism that's taking place industrialized nations around the world were quickly gobbling up and turning uh, non-industrialized areas into their colonies and the United States gets involved as well now it's it's a very interesting scenario because there's a big problem with this as far as the United States is concerned and that is that our history was of an as an anti-imperialistic nation and yet we turn into one during this time we jump in with all the other nations but it's this almost this spasm of um, imperialism that although we'll do things in the future that are a little bit like it there was there's never been another time since uh, imperialism which really lasts from 1890 until 1914 uh, when World War One begins where we have added as much outside territory and gotten as vol involved in many things as we did during this time so we'll pick up with our definitions and move into imperialism as we move into our next segment.